Welcome to The VT Show, a weekly online series featuring vineyard artists sharing conversation, insight, and performance. Please welcome Douglas Abel and Sarah Stern. Hello, and welcome to The VT Show. I'm Sarah Stern. And I'm Doug Abel, and we are the artistic directors of the Vineyard Theater. Uh, today, we're going to revisit a play from the Vineyard's past, one which has been on our minds a lot in these past few weeks. The play is Brutal Imagination by the brilliant poet and playwright Cornelius Eady, which the Vineyard premiered in early 2002. Our collaboration with Cornelius began actually in 1997 with his heartbreaking and, and deeply felt work, You Don't Miss the Water. And so we were thrilled when he came back to the vineyard a few years later and brought Brutal Imagination to us. Uh, to this day, it remains one of the most powerful and, and searing experiences we've had in the theater. A Brutal Imagination explores the notorious Susan Smith case in which in 1994, a white woman from South Carolina claimed that a black man had kidnapped her children in her car. This led to a nationwide search for nine days until she finally confessed the truth. She had invented the man and drowned her children. Brutal Imagination brings this invented man to life and tells the story of those nine days from his perspective. We're so very happy to have Cornelius Eady with us today. And find a bit later uh, in the conversation with the two extraordinary stars of the original production of Brutal Imagination, Joe Morton and Sally Murphy. Together, we will revisit this remarkable show and explore its resonance uh, to our current moment. So please, let's welcome Cornelia C.D. Hi. 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 Hi, Cornelia C.D. Lovely to see you. Good to see you too, yes. Yeah, we're very, very glad to be well, reunited and to have- I know, a long time. <laughs> opportunity to to talk about this play right now, especially in the context of our current moment. Now you are one of our country's great poets and you are. Okay. <laughs> and Brutal Imagination began not as a play, but actually as a cycle of poetry. Yes. And I wonder if you could just take us back and let's start at the beginning. What was the impetus, the inspiration for the cycle of poems, Brutal Imagination? Well, the short, version of the story would probably be that I wanted to explore the trigger for her. Why it was so easy for her to invent this guy, right? This, this imaginary guy, right? Um, she, I mean, Susan, you know, was tapping into something I think very ancient, very old, the idea of the boogeyman, the golem. And, um, and, I, and you know, the more, as I started to research the story, I became aware of the fact that um, Susan didn't really have any black friends at all, um, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, in Union, South Carolina. So, so she basically was sort of like tapping into something that was very, uh, a very ugly and you know deep well that that she knew was, but she knew was available. So I started thinking about uh, uh, about that, and I also started thinking about the guy. Um, you know, for those nine days that there was a nationwide search going on, you know, for for him, there there was this idea of of, of, of you know people looking for him, and if they're looking for him, he's real. And if he's real, if he really was, you know, a, a factual uh, being, um, what would those nine days be like? What would they What would they be like? You know, to to, to be a fugitive, somebody who's seen but not seen, somebody who's, who was invented just to do some so a little bit of dirty work, or or you know, what how would he What would he tell us if he could if he could report his condition to us? So that got me started on the cycle. And the whole cycle is in his voice, told from his perspective. Can you talk a little bit about how you your process in finding his voice? It really wasn't that complicated to find his voice, to tell you the truth. Um, it was it was just simply that, okay, I mean, you know, I, I actually had, I had nine days, I, haven't, I, had a, I had a narrative arc that was already written. We knew how it was gonna start, we knew what, what the search was gonna be, and we knew it was gonna end with her confession, right? So, so, so while he's walking around, you know, I, I, found, I found his voice in the first poem. Um, you know, was you know, which is just basically how I was born, and that was actually my experiment with the voice. What would he sound like, right? 
you know, um, you, you know, uh, though it's common belief that Susan Biff is inventing, you know, you know, you know when, I, when, when called, I come, my voice is my, my job is to get things done, I'm piecemeal. Uh, you, you know, you know, it, it was basically as I was writing that poem, I was hitting the tone. I was hitting his voice, and once I hit that voice, I, I realized that I could I could keep going at it. I could keep to, to vo and actually I could actually return to that voice. At the time, I was actually working on another piece. Uh, with Deidre Murray with, with Running Man, the the folk opera, um, you know that, that 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 we put together, and and uh, it was so in, such an intense um, uh, process that I had to stop writing the brutal imagination poems. I stopped doing that for maybe a year year and a half, and my fear was like, well, you know, I've been doing this on the show. Well, I'd be able to go back to his voice, and sure enough, as soon as I had felt I had some time cleared to actually go back to that voice, it was still there. It was still available. So, so, so um, I pretty much got the, the range of who, what he was sound like and what he was going to say in the in the first poem. The first, actually, the first three poems were written pretty much the way you hear them <laughs> or the way you read them um, in the book. Yeah, Cornelius, you mentioned uh, working with Deidre Murray, who I know you collaborated with first, yes. the Vineyard with you know Mr. Water, Running Man, and. Um, and on Running Man and both Brutal Meditations, of course, Diane Paulus directed uh, brilliantly. Um, I'm just curious because all of these pieces uh, seem to have a, 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 a deep connection between the poetry, the drama, and music. Uh, we had onstage musicians on these, and uh, it, it, it seemed like all the pieces felt like a piece of chamber music as well as theater. I'm just curious if you had conceived of them theatrically that way uh, uh, initially. No, that was a collaboration. That's where the collaboration went. With, with actually, with brutal imagination, to tell you the truth, I was actually very selfish about it. When, when, when I, when I was actually I got, I had been done with with Running Man, I loved Dream Running Man. It was a great show. But, but, but I, I felt like I was very selfish. And when I started writing the Susan Smith uh, poems, in my brain, I was saying, "This will not be a theater piece. <laughs> this will, this will just be a, a series of poems. I won't have to ask anybody. I won't have anybody. Been, nobody's fingerprints on it. It's just going to be my little you know, cycle." And then Deidre and I got a residency at the kitchen. Um, like a three-day residency in the kitchen, but we didn't have anything to do. <laughs> so Deidre said, well, you know, those poems, the brutal imagination poems, let's talk about trying to, and I was like, Deidre, I don't know. So, so, but, but, but once we got started, I realized, oh my God, what an idiot I'm being, what a dope, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's a narrative, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a story, right? It's, and it's in the lap and it's just, and it's just there to be um, explored and, you know, expanded upon theatrically. And, I'm glad you brought up the 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 the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the both Deidre and, and and Diane Paulus because you know they had a lot to do about how it changed, right? You know, I mean, I mean, it is a it is a, it is a theater piece. I remember at one point, um, actually, when we brought it to from the kitchen to to the vineyard. If I'm again, my I'm an I'm a geezer now, so my memories may not be that reliable. But the way but the way I remember it is 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 that. Um, uh, it, when we started working on it, it was actually a music theater piece. There were actually um, songs that went with this show, you know, and, and we went through the first stumble through and realized that it can't be a music theater piece, right? I, I mean, it was it was sort of like we you know, we went to it and suddenly you know I killed my babies you know <laughs> you know here comes the car you know I mean I mean you know it, it just was it it just felt weird right but you know but the evolution of it of working with Joe and working with um, Deidre and working with Diane in particular uh, really just uh, allowed me to actually start thinking about why you can go with this piece right what this you know you know all the different layers that this that this cycle actually held. And then, and then to physicalize it, not to be, not, not to simply just just um, uh, recite it, but actually to verbalize it, to actually make it make these characters move through space and interact with one another. And all for 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 the for the play to work, of course, what you had to have was a two person play. It couldn't all be in the interior voice of the black guy. So 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 the, so so I tried to 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 then to, to expand it into a two person play that gave space for the mirror image, so to speak, of Susan, who is really a monster here, <laughs> you know. Um, you, know you know, that was that was a fantastic process and I really loved going through it. I, 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 also, have, I also have memories of the first um, table read of, 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 of the script and hearing Joe 
uh, read those poems for the first time and what a um, absolutely electrifying um, moment that was for me. And actually hear those, those, those poems not um, on the page and not in my own voice, but, but also but captured uh, and brought to life um, by Joe. That feels like a really good transition for bringing Joe Morton out here and having him join us in this conversation. Hello. Hi, Hello. Joe. <laughs> so good to see everyone. It really is. Yes. So good to see you. So good to see you. Can you just say a little bit about when you first encountered this material, what, what you made of it, what your reaction was when you? I, I, I mean, I think the reason I wanted to do the play is it struck home immediately. It, it struck, it, it talked about all kinds of things that I think uh, black men, uh, black people in general, black men specifically go through in this country in terms of um, being looked on as criminals. I mean, how many times in my life as a young man did I walk down the street and see a, a woman clutch her purse or bring her child closer to her simply because of the presence of a black man or cross to the other side of the street because they thought maybe I was going to rob them. You know, um, I think that those things occur all the time. You know, I was reading a Walter Mosley novel this afternoon and at one point the main character is dressed in a blue suit standing on the corner not doing anything to anybody and two cops come up and say, can we see some ID? So, so these events happen all the time, to what extent? I mean, you know, we can talk about the Coopers, and I mean Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper. Um, so here you have this young woman who is uh, basically breaking the law, um, you know, walking her dog improperly in the park, and some gentleman, black gentleman, says, could you please do it properly? She says no, he films her, the next thing you know, she's on the phone, her phone, and telling the police that there is a black man, an African-American, I should say, an African-American man, threatening her. So all of these things, I mean, obviously that had happened when I read the play, but those kinds of things sort of really hit me very hard. I thought this is, this is telling a truth uh, that I think we all need to talk about. So, um, you know, and when I heard that Diane Paul was gonna do it, I was, you know, really happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Joe, maybe would you share, I know you have a few poems that you can share with us sure. today from the, uh, you know, that the text was drawn from the poems, but I think you would read these poems from the actual book of poetry. And I wonder if you could, could share the first one. Sure. Yeah. Um, in in um, both the book of poetry and in the play, there's a point at which after Susan has told the world that this black man uh, carjacked her kids and drove off with them, uh, the world believed that he was out there. There were posters that were put up, all kinds of things. And so this first poem was called Sightings. Now we have to remember, this man does not exist. This is something completely in her imagination. So the first poem is called Sightings. A few nights ago, a man swears he saw me pump gas with the children at a convenience store, like a punchline you get the next day or a kiss in a dream that returns while you're in the middle of doing something else. I left money in his hand. Mr. So-and-so who lives in such and such South Carolina of average height and a certain weight who may or may not believe in any of the basic recognized religions saw me move like an angel in my dusky skin and knit hat. Perhaps I looked him in the eye. Ms. So-and-so saw a glint of us on which highway? On the street that's close to what landmark? She now recalls the two children in the back appear to be behaving. Mr. So-and-so now knows he heard the tires of the car everyone is looking for crunch the gravel as I pulled up in the wee wee hours at the motel where he works the night desk. I signed or didn't sign the register. I took or didn't take the key from his hand. He looked or forgot to look as I pulled off to park in front of one of the rooms at the back. Did I say I was traveling with kids? Who slept that night in the untouched beds? Yeah. So suddenly the entire country, or certainly South Carolina, is seeing this man that doesn't exist. And the question has to be asked, why? Why, why would that happen? And I think part of it is, you know, the, the group's sub uh, unconscious. You know, this woman said a black man kid out her kid and drove away with them. So now everybody thinks they, you know, it's, in a horrible way, it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes, right? So no one is willing to say this guy doesn't exist, just like they're unwilling to say the emperor's not wearing any clothes at all. Um, and instead, this, this pursuit happens uh, simply because a white woman says a black man attacked her, and we believe it whether it's true or not. And so I, 
I was just stunned when I read this the first time to realize how quickly, uh, talk about a pandemic, something can sort of spread across a community. Yeah, right, yes. Some people watching may remember this case, some people may not remember this case. Um, you know, speaking to the poem that you just read, Joe, we, I think we actually have a clip of Susan Smith um, talking about uh, the man who she has invented, though, who, as she says, has kidnapped her children um, and also pleading for their return. And I wonder, maybe we should look at that, Kayla. Please let me take them. And he said, no, he didn't have time because they were in car seats and it was going to take time for me to get them out of the car seat. And um, they just told me, he said, but I won't hurt them. And he just took off. But he had a gun. And then my, my big thing is they were screaming, hollering, and crying. And I'm just scared that he just lost his patience or something. You I know? plead yeah, to the I, guy, to the man, me and my wife, plead to him to please return our children to us safely and unharmed. We love our children very much and we want them returned to us safe and sound. <laughs> Sitting on the floor in front of Susan, David Smith at her side, her tears falling on my hand, we began the interview. This day has been pure hell for both of you, I'm sure. Total chaos. It's been, it's been awful. Susan, you? Uh, I don't even know what to say in here. I hate it was a good word. I just feel like, I just feel like my whole world's been taken away. I mean, my, my children are my life. And, and I, they just got to be okay. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, though. Here you have a woman who does the worst thing possible, which is to kill her own children. And um, I think, uh, as Cornelius was sort of before this all started, was talking about her walk from the lake to the first house, which she had to make up the story in her head. So it's it's interesting to sort of talk about the fact that the only thing that could have been worse than what she did is that a black man did it, right. and that sounded like the story that was going to get her off. Right. Yes, my thought, my thought about that was exactly that, Joe, that, that my, my theory was that, that as she was walking away from the, from the, from the lake towards the first house that she found, she was actually inventing him, you know, actually, you know, pulling him from the ether, so to speak, mm. um, because, because, and because the question yet he, she had to ask, to answer was, was, you know, um, you know, who did this? And is it how plausible is it, right? I have to come up with something that's going to be plausible. So it's a black guy. Um, you know, uh, he had dead eyes. Uh, he was wearing a knit cap. Uh, you, you know, uh, he jumped in the car and he, he had a gun. And uh, you know, you know, you know, you, you know. But but the idea of the word black man pushes everything else out. out. Any other kind of reasoning out. Of, when you hear this, her see the story in the first clip, you have to think about that for a second, right? Black guy gets into a car, lets her go, but keeps her kids. Tells him, tells her, I won't hurt your kids, and then drives away with them. In the and South, a black guy in the South is going to do this, right? Right? And as 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 like, but if you start so so if you stop and start thinking about the components of that sentence, it doesn't make any sense, right? She knows the only thing that, that that's gonna keep the ball spinning the plate spinning in the air is the words black man <laughs> right? so uh, one of the poems that cornelius wrote which we, uh, we won't probably read today though is um I, I don't remember whether it's why i am not a woman or yeah, right it is yeah so so the poem basically is about even though she had invented this black man this black man had to also be a mother which is why she puts those words i i won't yes, have your right. children right. in his mouth that's right. Because that's that's the mother in her that didn't want to hurt her children who did. And so he becomes that person who says, uh, yes, but I won't hurt your children. Right. I think the, the other part of the poem is, you know, he didn't, you know, there is this kind of maybe supposition. He didn't know the kids from the car. We knew it too late. But anybody who's had kids, you know, you get into a Yeah, car, I know. You can yeah. smell it. <laughs> I know. Exactly. Way. Exactly, man. Yeah, right. So I mean, that was that was part of what Cornelius wrote as well. Was you know so you know the, the first time his foot brushes a ball, or the first time he smells the the formula, or the dry pee in the car, or you know, or the first time that one of these kids say, "Hey, who's that guy?" 
you know, he's going to turn around and think, oh, shoot, you know, what am I doing? Yeah. I mean, that would, that would have break, broken the spell right then and there, right? Yeah. Right? You know, but, but, but of course, you know, you have to, you, something that pushes through, say, you know, all that reason. And the reason I wrote that poem, actually, was thanks to a conversation with Bell Hooks. I was I was actually having had lunch with her and I was talking to her about about you know you know the, the cycle and she said, Well, you know, <laughs> of course she had to he, she had to make him a black man because you know if that was a black woman, it never would have flown. Right. <laughs> you know, a black woman pushes me and takes and, and kidnaps like it never would have happened. No one would have believed it for two seconds, right? So, 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 so it was, it, it was, it was sort of like, oh, oh that, that, that that poem was thanks to Bell, and Bell made me start thinking about the, you know, the impossibility of, of that moment, right? Uh, and you're right. I, I, you know, I don't have kids, but I have friends who have kids, and I have friends who have who have had kids, you know, at, at that and that suburban car was what I'm reconstructing in the poem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's is exactly the mem my memories of, of that. It's impossible not to know you're in a car with kids. <laughs> you know, you know, impossible. You know, so so so. I also wanted to point out in that moment. I think the duality of them, right, of, of both characters, of, of both Susan and the imaginary guy. And you're right. I, I think when I was listening to that clip, I was also thinking that I took some of that also from those from those clips where he's where he's where the thing where she's saying basically, you know, I, you know, I, I, I hope they're safe or I want to protect them. I hope they'll, they'll be strong. Right. All the stuff, you know, that kind of stuff coming out of her mouth. That's what I'm putting into his mouth. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. She also um, says that really interesting thing at the end of that clip where she says, I'm just afraid he'll lose his patience. Because right. She knows, Cause she yeah. knows the end of the story. Yeah. She knows the end of the story already. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I was trying to weld all that into that, into that poem, but the, but the, but the catalyst for that was bell hooks. Speaking of the duality, uh, we have uh, access, I believe, to the police sketch that she um, devised with the police with a photo of her, and it's quite kind of startling to see them together, if we could. There we go. Uh, <laughs> wow. Wow, you know, I got all sort of feelings about that. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, you know, uh, to me, it, it kind of reminds me of, 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 of you know Frankenstein and her monster, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, that, that's coming out of her head, you know. Oh. <laughs> but it's it's every it's every stereotypical black image she ever every seen. one any, man. any yeah. movie and any any television show she ever watched. She just shoved it all together because. Because it was available to her, because she yeah. could use that, and people would say, "Oh, I recognize that. I know, I, you know, I know who that is." Yeah, yeah, you know who that is. <laughs> you know? Within the cycle of poems of brutal imagination, you actually also explore some of these other mythical black figures of white imagination. You know, the uh, Uncle Ben and uh, Uncle Tom and Step and Fetch It, and who's not and a Jemima. not a myth that, and yeah, and Jemima. Um, Maybe can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. I, 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 I felt at that moment, at a certain moment, that the, that they had to be a kind of a shift in the poem where we sort of expand what he stands for, right, and what he, and what we're tapping into. So, so I, I thought that those that those characters actually did that. I mean, Uncle Ben, of course, is you know the, the you know the the, the you know, the porter who will always serve you, right? He'll always serve you, you know, serve the white the white person. Uh, Aunt Jemima, the same, you know, just 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 they're this this sweet mammy type. Um, Step and Fetch is, is kind of interesting for me because because Step is kind of subversive, you know, uh, you know he he you know he he he's basically acting as if. You know he's paying attention to the white man, but actually has his own agenda, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's so, and, and for a while, you know, Step was kind of a folk hero, uh, um, like Hattie McDaniel's, uh, uh, who, who played Mammy in Gone with the Wind. Once I think said uh, was was basically I'd rather play a maid uh, than be one, <laughs> you know, and, and get paid, and get paid, yes. Mm -hmm. And Step was Step was getting paid for that, and of course Uncle Tom. Which was was really was the first of of of, of, of the uh, of, of the characters, and, and for me as a writer, it, it almost felt like Uncle Tom at some point just actually uh, pushed his way into the narrative. As I was, as almost he, it's almost as if he slapped me and said, "Look, you gotta, you, you know, this is, you can put this in, man. <laughs> you know, you know." So 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 this this idea of again, you know, I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve a purpose. I'm here symbolically. Also that. That um, the idea of of, of the, the novel Cotam's Cabin and the popularity of it, 
was of course was an anti-slave, uh, you know, Tracy. So, 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 so the idea was that he was symbolic in a, in a, in a number of ways, but he's also a servant, right? And and I think I wanted um, uh, Uncle Tom to have some, you know, ha have a voice there, also to remind us just how large and old this is, <laughs> right? And, and, and you also, I mean, the other thing you get from what Cornelius wrote is um, all of these characters were written by white people. Exactly. They, they and, came and, out of the brain of a white person, right. not out of black mythology or legend right. or whatever, because the la I don't know if you remember it, but in the play, the very last of those characters is Stagali. Right. And Stagali stands up and says, pardon my French, but screw this stuff. I am not like any of those guys, if that's what you thought you were getting. I'm this rough and tough guy, so you have to deal with me. Um, and I thought that those two things really were interesting, that, that Cornelius managed to go the complete gambit in terms of the history of black people as written by white folks in terms of the mythology of who we were meant to be. I thought right. that was just brilliant. Well, I, I thought, I thought, I thought it, it, that was exactly, thank you, Joe, but, but I, so that was what I was thinking. I was, I was thinking about the idea how the right imagination plays this, right? And, um, and, and I was thinking, yeah, and Stagley's thing is basically there to say, I, if you really want to know what a gangster is, <laughs> you know. Now you found one. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, but you can't handle what this is, right? Right. right. Because, because, because it's not your imagination. You know, I'm, I, you can't control me. <laughs> you know, so, 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 I, yeah, I thought that that, that stag had to be there um, as an endpoint to to re remind us, you know, that, that 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 you know that that this is all this is all being driven by white imagination, you know, so. Yeah, you talk about the duality between Mr. Zero, as you call this man, and Susan Smith, and um, that is such a compelling part of this play, is the relationship between the two of them, the way they are the same and yet different, uh, and um, and what they need from each other. I and what they need from each other, yeah. What they need yeah. from each other to support. And I think to, to, to continue that conversation, it would be great to bring out Sally Murphy, who played Susan Smith in our production. And we've got her backstage. Hey, <laughs> Sally, Sam. Sally, Sally, <laughs> Sally. <laughs> Sally. <laughs> so good, good to see you. Good to see you. Great. Sally, same question for you, I think. When you encountered this material, what was your um, experience of it? And maybe more to the point, having to play somebody who had done such a terrible thing, how did you find your way into that? I, th I first got the script, I was in Chicago, and I thought, oh, oh my God, because you know, a great script is a great script, but you also have to play it. You know, and to play someone who did that, I thought, at first I just was like, I can't, I, I can't do it. And I even, I think I talked at my school, the, the acting class that day, and the, I said, for instance, I got this script today, and I said, I, I don't, and then like, uh, it, I, I kept looking at it and kept looking at it, and of course I did it. Um, yeah. Yay. Um, you know, uh, it was this group of magic people, you know, it's not, it, it, it was the most amazing, it was and is the most amazing group of people. And everyone was so collaborative and, yeah. you know, I, ne I never felt, no one made me feel bad for playing the part, you know, for, because of what she does. It was all, let's try to understand why she did it yeah. and, and work this out. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let's talk about more a little bit about that and the relationship between the two of them as you conceived it, Cornelius and Joe and Sally, as it felt for you to play it, kind of what that relationship was and what you did need from each other over the course of, of the play. I mean, I think, what Sally is, is inferring is, is, is that exactly right. I mean, the whole process was to figure out how this woman could do what she did and why she did it. And so it was all about just kind of charting out all of that stuff so that as the play went on, it wasn't so much about, um, it was about the history of this country in a certain right. sort of way. It was about the history of what a black man means in this country in many ways, and that she was the conduit for that, that she, put herself in a position, as I said before, to do the worst thing possible and understood almost automatically that one of the ways out of that was to blame someone black who was also male and that, that the heat would come off her right away and it would be about her. And I think once we all understood that, we actually began to move yeah. in that direction. So how was she, you know, how was Sally moving? How was she, you know, holding on to me, literally? How was she holding on to this imagination? How, you know, why didn't this guy, in her imagination even say, look, you know what, this isn't working, I'm out of here. And he, she didn't, it worked, you know, until the moment that the sheriff realized, oh, I see, 
Yeah. You've got something else going on. Yeah. I studied that videotape so much, so it was funny when you when you were playing it. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time I I I from from watching that, Susan, I just acted with my with the skin of her face. That's what I saw mm -hmm. that she it was all just like, you know, if it was my profile, it was like just here. And, the, and, and watching it just now, I thought it's it that's right. And because of course she's it's a, it literally is a mask for the monster who did what she did. And and it's just so it's weird. I mean, in many ways, I suppose Mr. Zero uh, in obvious ways is her guilt. Yeah. You know, is a personification of her guilt. Um, yeah. not simply of the crime. But of her guilt. I mean, you know, it's kind of like a child, you know, who breaks a lamp and says, "No, no, he did it." You know. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I think that 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 you're getting that that is kind of where we're going with this. Also, um, that you know, she was, um, you know, that that the relationship was kind of like, you know, um, she, she, he needs her to basically um, get to the place where she needs to be, right? So he doesn't destroy her, right? But he sort of gets her to the point where she has to finally confront yes. the truth. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the difference between the book of poems and, and, and the play, right? Is is that is that we have Sally there, it's again trying to go through this arc of really in a way discovering what she did to own what she did, right? Right? And one of my backstories about, about Mr. Zero. Was was that sometimes he wins and sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> That's right. So he doesn't really know how it's going to end, right? He doesn't know whether or not he's going to be able to convince her. You know, to to this is what you this is where you need to go. This is what you need to confess. You need to let go of this and let go of me, right? Right. Um, you know. Um, but but sometimes it doesn't work out, right? Because it's racism. <laughs> Right, so it was, doesn't always work out. So, so I thought that to me again, you know, backstory to me that was the stakes in some to some degree for for both of them, right? That 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 he might he he might actually not win this fight, this little struggle they're going through, and you know, and she may not get to the point where basically she can actually just accept that this is you are a murderer, you killed your kids, you and you blamed. Um, somebody who could have been swept off the street and executed, right, um, for your action. Because believe me, when the trial was going on, um, you know, that was the sentiment. You know, you find a black guy and you burn him, <laughs> you know. How many posters did they make? Oh, let me, oh, oh my God, thousands. Thousands, thousands of them. Thousands, thousands, of them. Yeah. thousands of them, thousands of them. I, I, and I know the element because because I'm, I'm friends with, um, uh, the sister of, of of the defense attorney for Susan Smith, and well, and well, and, you know, and before that happened, you know, the, 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 she 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 was telling me through her brother what the element, what the what what the tone was in town, right? They wanted this to be done quickly. They wanted to find somebody, somebody black quickly, <laughs> you know, and they almost did. So so I think one of the uh, happy endings, if you can say about 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 that story, is that. We're still talking about this, knowing what actually happened, as opposed to talking about the unfortunate innocent African American who got caught and then executed. <laughs> you know, you know, back in 1996 or something, right? Right, right after the trial, right? I mean, so, 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 it, it, it would be like it would be like you know, um, um, that is one um, horrible. Um, destiny that didn't happen. <laughs> well, that, that's the definition of him losing, right? Yes, and the definition of his losing. His losing would, would, would have been some innocent guy getting fried in the electric chair. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I just wanted to, to add, folks, for people who haven't seen the show, um, not just the magic and the brilliance of these two actors and, and a, a kind of incredible dance of pain and death and and all of that, but our design team, uh, it's Mark mm -hmm. Wenland and uh, Kevin Adams, really created a, a, a sort of magical, strange universe upon which this dance existed. And I think we have a couple of production shots and I thought maybe it might be nice to 
uh, to show them now. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh. wow. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh, wow. Mm. Oh. Well, and the idea with that set was that it was meant to be kind of the inside of her imagination and her psyche, all of the pieces of her life that could be repurposed and recreated to to tell this story, right? Kind of spelling out, not it being able to be controlled, trying to be controlled. Well, it was all bits and pieces of her, yes, of her imagination that we actually plucked off that pile of yeah. whatever what that exactly. stuff was, you know. Um, so it was the car, it was all kinds of things, you know, all the things that I mentioned in terms of the baby bottles and balls and all that stuff was in that thing. I mean, what I loved about the play physically was that at the end of the evening, the stage was just a mess, <laughs> which I thought was wonderful. Yeah. I agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. I, also, uh, yeah. I also wanted to mention something else, which I didn't even remember. And then I thought about it. Um, this was actually the first show that we went into rehearsal with after 9-11, 2001. Yeah, true. Uh, it's, it's absolutely, I give credit to all of you how audacious and daring uh, and courageous it was to take this subject on at that moment in time. Uh, uh, for those of you out there who were around downtown theater, um, I, I remember hanging this huge American flag in our window the week after 9-11. Mm. Uh, every night uh, we would be yeah. very, sweet and honest way, you know, thanking our firemen because so many had lost their lives and raising money for them. And um, there was it was a rare moment of, let's just say, a, a kind of unified sense of let's all get together and mm -hmm. and uh, get our com country back on its feet. And then there we were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ass with this... Uh, yeah. Very powerful piece about race in America. I was just curious if any of you thought of that at the time, because literally, I think we went into rehearsal like a month or two after it was. It was yes, something. yes, I, I know. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I think that was that was one of the most bravest things I've ever seen. <laughs> to tell you the truth, gutsy, you know, ballsy. Yeah, you know, I mean, I really, it, it really was. I mean, because because exactly, it, it, it's a, it's not a fun piece. It's not a, you know, hey, we're going to go to the dog patch and have some fun with this, you know, with this, you know, with with this murderous, right? It 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 was it was it was basically, you know, yeah, this is this is what where we're we're gonna talk about something. It, it'll be cathartic when you get through it, right? But, you know, but 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 it's not it's not you know it's not light entertainment. And 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 I just and I just thought, my God, you guys, you know, going to go forward with it. I would have totally understood if you'd simply said, you know what? <laughs> you know, you know, but but what I loved about the venue, and I still love about the venue, is that is that you you went there, right? Um, you you believed in in what this was, what what the piece was was about. You believed what the piece was 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 was, was saying, and and you felt it was necessary to be out in the world, right? And and you know, and off we went. <laughs> on Were you venture. guys at all trepidatious about doing the play? No. I don't, no. I don't feel yeah. That. Yeah. See, that's, that's my point. point. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we. I don't think any of us did. Yeah. That's we my were, point. Yeah. We were just about to st when 9/11 hit. We were about to start performances on a on a evening of one X by Doug Wright that were uh, very entertaining and light. And I know that company of actors was very fearful about this is not the right moment for that. And yet, actually, it was because yes. people <laughs> needed a, a a laugh or two. And I actually feel like. I, I then felt that doing Brutal Imagination was sort of a bracing kind of cold shower mm -hmm. after a month or two of everybody feeling, you know, sort of sorry for themselves and needing comfort food. And do, do, do you know what I mean? I felt like yeah. it. And I thought the audiences were very engaged. And, yeah. Oh, and, God, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Sort of in stunned silence during it in a really good way. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's a tribute to these brilliant actors who just brought it to life and it, it, it was just really magical. Do you guys remember that we would never take our breaks? When you, you know you get your stage manager gives you a break mm -hmm. and she, our great stage manager finally just gave up because they said, okay, we're on a break. <laughs> and then we would just be like, we, we literally never stopped. I mean, That's true. That's true. That's, you're yeah, because we would, we would keep talking. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, we were a Gabby uh, 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 gang. Yeah, we really were. We, yeah, but, we, but, but it was good. It was a really good thing. You're right. Oh we my God, it was great. Yeah, it was heaven. I, I agree with you. We really liked to hang. That was really something like I remember, <laughs> you know, very clearly. Uh, you know, but we were all, we because we were, at least from my point, we were all in this zone. Right, we were all in that zone, right? Yes. You know, and and it was sort of like so everyone was pulling in the same direction. It wasn't sort of like you know, it was sort of like we, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. This is really going to be cool. We're really going to do this. This is going to be like yeah, come on, let's do it. You know, uh, you know, you know. I mean, it was it was it really felt that way, right? You know, everyone was in the boat. Everyone was pulling, right? And 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 I, and I just felt, and that was it. And we were so excited about it that we just kept, you know. You know, you know, pushing each other, right? Right, and pulling. Well, each other we also and, kept trying to change things, trying to figure out what we were right. to say these things. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, we did, we we go through all these different variations about how it could be, you know, how it could how it could happen, right? How we could get there. We need to get here. How can we get there? Right, right. So, 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 so that's when we could do anything because it's her mind. Right. Yes. And we, yeah, no. and we, and and that and and knowing that was very liberating. I think it'll, you know, and and we ran with that. And I thought that was really one of, again, one of the most incredible experiences because of that. You're right, Sally. We just did, at some point, it, it just, it didn't apply, any, uh, apply you know. Yeah. There were, you know, we, we simply wanted to go until we figured it out, you know. You know, so, so, so I mean, I mean, and that's how deeply involved we were. Let's also do a shout out. The aforementioned wonderful stage manager, Christine Daly. Is, yes. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and, and also uh, the... <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> so good! And, oh and he also had an amazing sound designer, Brett Jarvis. Who, yeah. Uh, oh, he, yeah. He got some awards for his work on that show. Yeah. Oh sound, my God. Sound he, and lights. Yeah, he, he was. Yeah. Did he do both? Uh, just no. Sound. No, just sound. sound. Um, okay. Uh, but the light, but the lights. I remember reminded me of a passage out of Invisible Man because of the way the way that all those bulbs. I think. Yeah, Kevin Adams did that uh, brilliant design, and I believe yeah. Fiona Samoji did the costumes. Uh, I hope mm -hmm. I. Ooh, I got that right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, it was really a, a really a special collaboration. You're right, Joe. It was almost you walked in the theater, and these amazing lights, which extended from the stage yep. over the audience, so everybody was suddenly brought into this awful landscape. You know that was the detritus. You know her 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 mind, as you said. Yeah, yeah. And there we all work together, yeah. living in this nightmare. Joe, I wonder, could you share one of the other poems with us? So yes, uh, we were talking about what would happen if Mr. Zero failed, and that failure would mean that they have found someone to fit the description. And so this next poem is called "Next of Kin." The black man in town, they thought, looked like me, without the dreamed up cap and wardrobe. The police have him now, and he sits in a small room. They turn him this way and that. He'll cool there for hours. How do you think he feels? I whisper, we're innocent, into his ears. He looks so much like me, we could be brothers. Already folks may have their doubts. He's poor enough. Where has he been? He has needs. What do they know? Neighbors call him quiet. A new knot of stress on the tongue. It's been a hard week to be black in Union, South Carolina, a black woman tells a reporter. The whites aren't civil. They look at you and then reach over and lock their doors. Now, he is it. Susan has lent me his cheekbones, his gait. For a while, he is as close as they'll ever get. Wow. So, you know, there you have that moment when uh, they find someone who fits the description. Um, I don't know all of the details, but I'm going to imagine that he was nowhere near anything that was happening, so there was no way to put it on him. Yeah. But, but that was the great, horrible possibility that they would find someone who matched the description and be able to do whatever they do to say, this is the guy. I mean, I mean without, without her realizing it, you know, she was setting, as, as Cornelia said, setting somebody up for a lynching. Yeah. Yeah. Can you lose those guys? We're here. We're here. 
Can you hear us, Sally? Sally, we lost you. Are you there? Oh, no. Made of to. Joe, I was just looking at the Who Am I poem. Can you hear sure. me? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at the script and realized how we said it together at the end, seen but not seen as if suddenly given the power to move through walls, mm. to know every secret without permission. And then we said this together, we roll sleepless through the dark streets, but inside the cab is lit with brutal imagination. Mm. Excuse me, Charles. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Because that's that's what I mean. Everyone was thinking this guy was just driving around, yeah. you know, um, going to motels or whatever they thought he was doing, um, simply because it had been put out there. Yeah. 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 Obviously, something we have seen play out again and again, and Did everybody go? not always. And oh, Sally, you might need to log out and log back in. Well, you can't see us. You can't see us? <laughs> I'm going to take it. You can't hear us either. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sally? Should we sign out? I can't yeah. hear you. Maybe open your window if it's not open. We're getting a note about that. We're vamping. I know that there's another poem that it would be great to have you read, but of course. OK, I'll sign out. Be able to. No, okay. she, yeah, she sounds actually way to get back in, yeah. Okay. And come back in. <laughs> Gone, but not forgotten. I know, only one dropout so far. That's not bad <laughs> for these things. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe talking too soon, right? <laughs> you know. Uh -oh. Well, maybe Cornelius, this is a little bit of a turn, but I just wonder if you can talk about as a poet and playwright, and Joe too, this is for you too. I think what you see is the relationship between poetry and theater and Joe for you doing this text that was drawn from poetry um, you know if that's a different kind of experience than you know working with text that's originally conceived as dialogue Just well in a way I mean as you were talking I was thinking well it's not too different than doing Shakespeare right because Shakespeare comes in and out of poetry and prose um, or doing uh, and, and any number of different kinds of plays that are written in a poetic manner um, I, I think what made this different was really simply the the material itself. The fact that we were talking about something that I had never heard any other playwright talk about in this way because of the opportunity that afforded itself because of what Susan had done. So it really wasn't so much going from um, kind of a poetry to a kind of dialogue. Even the dialogue that we came up with sort of still felt like poetry. Yeah. So, yeah. so we hadn't really sort of gone that far astray from what Cornelius had originally written. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was and also the idea of. Um, I, I think we have we got one of our many discussions about that uh, before we, you know, uh, you know, um, where where basically we're talking about the, the pitfalls of, of 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 not falling into recitation, but actually acting the lines, right, right, because because you know it's a it's a, like use Shakespeare as the example when you see a really bad Shakespeare production, they're usually intimidated by the language. You no, know, mm -hmm. they simply think it's poetry, and they have to just you know be, be strict eye on the pentameter, and it's a bore, right? Because because what it's really it's, it's two people talking to one another, or or it's, or it's the king trying to do this. I mean, you know, but 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 you should you should be the actor needs to to take the take the text, take the poetry, and and say this is I'm actually in real time talking to you about humanizing, this. humanizing, hum yeah. humanize, humanizing, and that's exactly what we did, I think, with uh, with with this production. We we didn't we weren't intimidated by the fact that it was that it was um, that, that that the that the core of it was was poetry. Yeah. And because poetry is is an abbreviated language, it means you have to yes. even work work harder to make right. sure that you're hitting yes. all of, all of the beats that you need to hit. Exactly, exactly. But but doing it in such a way that you're, you're not um, belaboring right. <laughs> the process. Right. Yeah. yeah. That may also relate, Cornelius, to what you were saying earlier that. Your initial impulse with Deidre was to musicalize some of the text, but then when you got to the story, <laughs> yeah. it's so present and so yeah. powerful that music really was in the way, in a sense, and that you, yeah. you had just such an opportunity for two actors uh, to really go at it, you know, and and uh, uh, explore the nuances and the the, the 
the, the peaks and the valleys of it that uh, the language just didn't need any anything extra. Yeah, mm -hmm. melody actually cluttered it up, you know, and and you know, and it was, was really kind of surprising. But 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 again, I, I thought that it was the it, uh, we did a stumble through of it. I seem to recall. There actually might be a recording of that somewhere. That's uh, be the only one in existence. The stumble through with the songs there, but uh, but but it was very clear that the the tonal breaks from what they were doing in acting and then what they were had to do to perf to do the song was just so jarring. You know that 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 rehearsal wouldn't been the rehearsal wouldn't have been the the cure to that. You know for that. It, it was it, it was simply just in the way, you know, unintentionally. We were trying to, you know, we, we, we discovered it as we went along. Mm -hmm. yeah. Welcome back. I don't know what happened. But <laughs> you're back. You're back. back. <laughs> many places. Yes. Back. Since you are back, I wonder if we could could jump right in because I know that there is another poem, um, really one of the last in the show that would be great to be able to to hear. If you guys are up for that. Yeah. Sure, this is the last poem in the cycle. It's called Birthing, and it's, um, it's a moment where uh, Mr. Zero basically talks about how this imagination was born. When I left my home on Tuesday, October 25th, I was very emotionally distraught. I have yet to breathe. I am in the back of her mind, not even a notion a scrap of cloth the way a man lopes down the street. Later, a black woman will say, we knew exactly who she was describing. At this point, I have no language, no tongue, no mouth. I am not me yet. I'm just an understanding. That road, road, road. I felt even more anxiety. Susan parks on a bridge and stares over the rail. Below her feet, a dark blanket of river she wants to pull over herself, children and all. I am not the call of the current. She is heartbroken. She gazes down and imagines heaven. I felt I couldn't be a good mom anymore. That I didn't want my children to grow up without a mom. I am not me, yet. At the bridge, one of Susan's kids cries, so she drives to the lake, to the boat dock. I am not yet opportunity. I had never felt so lonely and so sad. Who shall be a witness? Bullfrogs, waterfowl. When I was at John D. Long Lake, I had never felt so scared and unsure. I've yet to be called. Who will notice? Moths, dragonflies, field mice. I wanted to end my life so bad. And I was in my car ready to go down that ramp into the water. My hand isn't her hand, panicked on the emergency brake. And I did go part way. But I stopped. I am not gravity. The water lapping against the gravel. I went again and stopped. I then got out of the car. Susan stares at the sinking. My muscles aren't her muscles, burned from pushing. The lake has no appetite, but it takes the car slowly, swallow by swallow, like a snake. Why was I feeling this way? Why was everything so bad in my life? Susan stares at the taillights as they slide from here to hidden. I have no answers to these questions. She only has me after she removes our hands from our ears. It's quite something to hear this language again and to get to hear it in our present moment with everything that we are going through in our country right now. I think when we reached out to Cornelius wanting to revisit this and to you, Joe and Sally, I think it's it felt like it had already been on all of your minds as well, this piece right mm. now. And um, I don't know, Cornelius, do you want to say anything about that? Well, that they just read or, or what they just read or this? Well, it's, it, it's, it's really powerful to hear though, both of you read this again. I haven't heard the, that um, course in years, 
So, so it's it's very it's very moving, but but it's also moving because I'm 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 made aware of, of the moment we're going through right now, where the African American body and the African American male body is under such such danger right now. I mean, it's not that we never had that it wasn't, but it's, it seems to me now to be accelerated by the moment we're going through, and you know the destruction of the African American uh, male body or the onslaught, however you want to put that. It's also what listening to your reading of my poem brought to, to mind for, to me. And um, I just think it's one of those pieces that, you know, you know, in some way, shape or form needs to be back out in the world, <laughs> you know, somewhere. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and it, you know, it really, it's the, the giving it actively back, you know, into the dialogue is something that I think could be very powerful. Uh, but. We do too. We agree with you, which is one of the reasons we're really grateful to all of you for gathering here today and revisiting it um, together. It, we're, we're I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Really. Thank you. This thank is this. This has just been a wonderful hour. <laughs> you know. Oh, so much. We um we normally leave a little time for questions. I don't think we actually have questions today, but we do have <laughs> we do have some comments. So we'll just share a couple. Of Okay. Um, this is from Jake Beasley, a lovely human being who used to work at the vineyard uh, and was there at the time of, of brutal imagination. And he wrote, watching this incredible work come together and seeing the way you affected audiences every night was an unforgettable experience, mm. especially at that time. Uh, and Jennifer Batista on Facebook wrote in one of the best shows I've seen at the vineyard. We'll we'll take that, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that works for us. Uh, and there were more comments too, but but uh, I I will just uh, thank you all again so much for for being here and exploring this with us today. And like you say, Cornelius, we hope that this is not the the last that we're going to be seeing of this piece, but that um, you know we, we will be finding ways to bring it you know forth again and in, into the conversation in new ways. So. Um, yes. Just would like to add, as we said before, uh, this production of Brutal Imagination was born uh, at a very difficult time um, after 9-11. And um, it's it's lingered with me all these years. <laughs> I think about it all the, of, of all the shows I've worked on in, in several decades at the Vineyard. It's the one, the, the power of these performances and the beautiful language and the eloquence of the work it's just stuck with me year after year. And uh, I, I think uh, it could not be more telling or important or valuable now, especially during this time. So thank you, Cornelius. And thank you, Joe and Sally, for, for bringing this beautiful thing to life. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. Thanks well, well, thank you for giving us the, the space to do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yes. <laughs> thank you. All yeah. could have, uh, that, this show couldn't, couldn't happen anyplace else but the vineyard. You know, you know. So, so, so. Thank you for allowing that to become what it is. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for letting us collaborate with you on it. It was yeah. a great gift. To it us. was an honor, really. Yeah. Feel the same. I also want to thank everybody at home, everyone watching, for joining us and for your support and interest in these shows over the past months. We are so glad and grateful to have this forum to connect with you and to bring our vineyard community together. We're actually going to take a hiatus now from the VT show uh, mm -hmm. at the end of July, and we'll be back uh, later this summer, and we're gonna be announcing a new lineup of shows soon with some incredible artists to take us into the fall. Uh, till then, we are wishing you all a wonderful summer. Uh, stay safe and be well. Yes. Don't get dead. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you for tuning in to The VT Show, brought to you live every Tuesday at 5 p.m. If you would like to view previous episodes, you can find them on Facebook and YouTube. See you next week.